we have this video of one of your day your your daily staples. I, I take it. Um, this is from <laughs> Brian has a very entertaining YouTube channel. Uh, anyone listening to this can you know check those out. He's he's very uh, good at you know put it, putting his ideas uh, in a presentable form on on YouTube. And I took a clip from one of his meal plans uh, because uh, Liz and I were looking at this earlier, and I, I want to play that so that people get a sense of, you know, this is how you structure, uh, you know, every, every aspect of your life is structured, including of course your meals. So uh, let's play that to see like, what does it take to start living this kind of lifestyle? To start, weigh and chop your raw vegetables. First, take cauliflower for anti-inflammatory and fiber. Do the same with your broccoli. Broccoli is for antioxidants, bowel health, and fiber. Measure out 50 grams of either shiitake or maitake mushrooms for immune system health, one peeled clove of garlic for heart and immune health, and three grams of ginger for a variety of benefits including liver, pancreas, artery health, and digestion. Boil the broccoli, cauliflower, and mushrooms together for seven to nine minutes until fairly soft. The base of your super veggie will be 150 grams of cooked black lentils for protein and fiber. Add one tablespoon of cumin for inflammation, liver, and pancreas health. One tablespoon of hemp seeds for healthy omega-6 and 3. Add the chopped ginger and garlic you put aside earlier. Add one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar for blood sugar and taste. I also add one tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil to every meal I eat for its incredible whole body benefits. You've now completed Super Veggie. Good job! Eating this can take me up to 34 minutes. I know, I've timed it. So sometimes I do a blended version. It's just as delicious and takes less time to eat. I, I love that. Uh, I love the, um, like, how many minutes did you shave off that? But Do you shave off that, by the way, when you blend it and eat it? 21. Wait, so you shave off 21 minutes, so you eat it in 13 minutes? Yeah. That's a, that's a huge time saver. Liz, Why? are you ready? Are you on board yeah, with this? Like, no, I mean, this looks disgusting, frankly. Like, how is oh, it? Like, is this? It's, it's is got it, apple is it cider good? for flavor, though. Yeah. Is is it good? And like, like, you know, is, are you just the type of person where the trade-offs, like to me eating, you know, the vast majority of meals like that sounds unappealing to the point where I probably would stop looking forward to tomorrow, mm. but you seem to be, you know, is there, is there a personality difference where like, I'm a hedonist in pursuit of different things, playing a different game, but you find, you know, eating the, uh, maitake mushroom cauliflower broccoli combo to be much less, uh, awful than I would find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a highly predictable observation. And I'd say when I see people go through this process, they eat it and their initial reaction is, huh, not that bad. Actually, mm -hmm. it's kind of good. And then day two, I feel amazing. And then day seven comes around and they say, I can't imagine going back to what I was eating before. Mm -hmm. And I'd say 95% of people I uh, interact with go through this identical process. They initially consider it to be unfathomable that they would actually enjoy vegetables. I feel like, well, I mean, I love vegetables. I cook a ton. Um, but I almost think that maybe I, uh, in the grand scheme of things, fall more into like the Tim Ferriss territory where like he's very cute and, you know, measures um, so many different components of what he's eating and tries to make sure that there's, you know, ample protein and has a whole supplement routine and all of these things. But then there's like very cute little uh, exceptions for the four hour body where it's like, you can have like a dry red wine, maybe like two glasses of like a Malbec or whatever. And it's a little bit like, I don't know if there's actually as much scientific backing behind this as Ferris perhaps wants people to believe it's more that like, he really likes Malbec and it's hard for him to sort of stay on that type of thing. Like, what do you make of, do you find that more people can be successful with that type of approach or is this approach really like, does it just take, um, you know, a deeper understanding of the trade-offs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the difference is that no human has seriously attempted to defy death. Yeah. That's my objective mm -hmm. yeah. is for the 25th century to say in the early 21st century, there was a legitimate scientific approach to not only defy death, but prepare all of intelligence for super intelligence. 
So I'm not trying to influence and make friends. I'm not trying to be cute. I'm not trying yeah. to, I'm trying to change the trajectory of the species. And the thing that I've tried to do is be true to the scientific evidence. And this that is makes so, a lot of sense. I mean, to put but, this in, go ahead. Oh, well, the thing that I'm just curious about is like, aren't people so, you know, in, in some ways people are rational actors, you know, acting in their own self-interest, but in other ways, we're these pleasure seeking animals who love to self-sabotage. And so, you know, how does this play out where like, perhaps we, you know, per your research and experimentation do stumble upon a pretty solid formula for how to really, really extend your lifespan and health span. But we're still these like, you know, McDonald's cravings, craving creatures at the end of the day, always pursuing sex and cigarettes. I'm like, like, how do you look at that? The compliance thing? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to make the observation that when there were 13 colonies, they were torn between continuing under the, under the monarch mm -hmm. and going down the path of this new weird idea of democracy. And Thomas Paine kind of put things over the edge with his common sense pamphlet, 500,000 copies were sold. Mm -hmm. We ended up doing the democracy thing and democracy ended up being a better system of intelligence management for a large collection of people. The monarch, was actually pretty inefficient and pretty poor at creating uh, wealth. Yeah. And what I'm proposing in, in the same way that my mind is a monarch and my body is the democracy. And so what I did is I said, I'm going to ask my organs what they need to be their best selves. And so I measured every single one and said, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. We looked at the scientific evidence. And so this is the algorithm. The algorithm works in conjunction with my body's biological processes and determines what I eat when I go to bed. And what I'm proposing, this transition's inevitable. We, we are, it doesn't matter what humans say about this. This is happening as we speak right in front of our eyes. Algorithms are doing things better than we can in every regard. Yes, we are pleasure seeking self-sabotage animals, but that's only because we don't have the tools and technology to get ourselves out of that. You take one example where that's solved, like Ozembic, and humans consume more of it than the manufacturer can produce it. Now, even mm -hmm. with the side effects of Ozembic, Ozembic is an algorithm that turns off your hunger receptors. Are humans willing to adapt technology to modify their pleasure-seeking, sabotaging self? Yes. How fast? It's ferocious. And so what I'm trying to show is an algorithm that does this towards the, the goal of tomorrow. But our time horizon for Ozempic adoption is admittedly small, right? Uh, in what regard? Well, we've only just started to, you know, see people like, like we have no idea whether the demand will majorly slow, whether the side effects, um, you know, as they present themselves will end up, you know, lessening demand. We just kind of, we're still in the first, what, two or three years of this really being adopted. And so I'm curious about what it'll look like 15 years oh, from sure. now. Yeah. I mean, and I'm not even, uh, suggesting that Ozemic is a good idea. Yeah. I'll I'm not, I'm not even suggesting that it's worth it. I mean, I think the side, mm -hmm. of, the side effect profile is interesting, but what I'm saying is um, I'm, I'm making the observation, we humans love to shit on new ideas that challenge our understanding of reality or challenge our preferences for our own vices. Mm -hmm. And the moment yeah. we get a chance to relieve ourselves from that burden, we run away with it. And so what I'm, suge what I'm suggesting to you is it doesn't matter what, any of us say about reality, our preferences, our wants, or our needs. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's all a smoke screen. It's what's, interesting. What's the future? Your... Well, I was, I just want to stay on this for one second. What's the future of sex in that same vein? Like if you say the future of eating is not the Liz path, but the Brian path, what is the future of sex in, you know, the 25th century? How will people find that pleasure for themselves? Yeah. The, if you truly sit into this thought experiment and you genuinely contemplate whether we are in fact homo erectus and it could entirely be the case the only rational response is to say i don't know that if 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 the, the intelligence disparity between us and an insect is some orders of magnitude and the intelligence difference between us and AI is an equally, if not greater level of you know, orders of magnitude. Mm. How would we dare say anything about the future? And this is why I come back to don't die every single time. 
for the first time in human history, the only thing we can utter, which makes any sense whatsoever, is we don't want to die. We don't know if we want happiness. We don't know if we want sadness. We don't know if we want depression. We don't know if we want hunger. We don't know anything because we're, we're going into this, this new phase of existence where we have the controls over reality. So mm -hmm. sex is a biochemical state. Like uh, just remove for a moment the physical act. It is a biochemical state of stimulation. We can mm -hmm. absolutely program that, no questions asked. So what is the future of arousal, you know, and, and will we want arousal? Like how big, to me, the thing that's interesting is if, if we, if you go back a few hundred years and you say, how big is reality? You'd say, well, I can use my five senses and kind of fill out existence. I can smell certain things. I can understand the texture of certain things when I feel, but you'd have an answer. And then you fast forward a couple hundred years and you figure out the electromagnetic spectrum we experience a trillionth of the actual uh, electromagnetic spectrum of reality. There's a microscopic world beyond the res resolution of our eyes, which is near infinite. The galaxy is, is almost so big, we can't even understand it. And so if you say, what is the conscious, what is the state of consciousness? Like how big could consciousness be? What could we actually experience? Now, right now we have feelings like happiness and sadness. We know what it's like to fall in love and to break up be in pain. We know what it's like to skin our knee. We have a certain set of, of experiences of what it actually feels like to be human, but we have no clue if the future of conscious existence is going to be the same difference in order of magnitude as we've experienced a physical reality. Why not? And this wow. is again, like why in this moment, uh, it's a invitation for soberness and humility we've never had before. I, I appreciate that call for just extreme epistemic humility. And what yeah. you're seem to be saying is that the one thing that is consistent again, uh, across all biological creatures is the drive to not die. Uh, and um, that uh, to keep, you know, propagating the genes and um, that maybe that's that's the drive to, to follow uh, in, in this, uh, I don't know, in, interregnum we're in right now. The, and I, I mean, it, it struck me when you were saying like, okay, my brain is the monarch and now it's listening to my organs. Uh, and this is like the democracy of the body. It's like that this was, you're, you're reversing the, in, you know, historically there was, there was this group called the physiocrats who took the function of functions of the body and then tried to extend that as a metaphor mm. to look at the ideal political system. And now you're folding the, pol the politics back into the body, which is pretty fascinating. What would it, uh, well, what would it look like um, if our society, our culture, started taking that idea seriously mm -hmm. um what would how would politics government yeah. society look different um from uh, yeah. if that change would happen i mean if what i'm basically playing for is ai progress is going to create existential crisis in society it's going to do simple things like it's going to take our jobs we're not going to know what identity means anymore to have a profession or we're going to whipsaw so much. It's going to be very hard to retrain ourselves at that speed. It's going to do things like potentially be better at governance. It's going to potentially be thing, do things better, like telling the truth. It's going to be better at, you know, and the list goes on and on. When that happens, we're going to face these really imminent practical questions. Who do we trust for governance? Who do we trust as a politician? Who do we trust to tell us the correct answer? What do I do for a job? How does economics work? Who pays taxes? So all these basic questions that we've, we've solved in our society, like we've really have a functional society with a lot of basic questions answered about our existence. They're all going to be called into question. And in that moment of existential crisis, we will have these basic questions to play. Then what, what do we do? What's our game? Do we all buckle down on religion that we just think the afterlife is a game that's to play for? Do we say capitalism is the answer? Let's keep on trying to make money at any cost. Do like, what do we do? And what I'm suggesting is there is no philosophical, political, practical, economic model 
that slides in there that adapts for the existential threats we have as a species and the potential where we have uh, that we have with superintelligence. I'm trying to build the guiding ideology for the 21st century that transitions us from Homo sapiens to whatever comes next. And don't die is not it's not just about me individually. Don't die is practically relevant to don't die individually. Don't kill each other. Don't kill the planet and align AI with don't die. Hmm. You have this practical question, like you build super intelligence and then what do you do with it? Do you become better at war? Do you conquer more territory? Do you make more money in the stock market? Do you get more social media followers? Like what do you do with this new superpower? And if you walk AI into the old games that homo sapiens have played for 200,000 years, we're probably going to annihilate ourselves and not too, not too long. And what I'm suggesting is, go ahead. No, 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 please finish. What I'm suggesting is in any other time of existence, we'd say, well, we're all going to die anyway. So what does it matter? And that so easily justifies a martyrdom kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. And what I'm calling into question is that may not be true for the first time in history. And if mm -hmm. that's not true, every single observation we have about reality right now is probably dead. It's probably on its way out. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our new show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. New episodes drop every week, so subscribe to Reason TV's YouTube channel to get notified when that happens or to the Just Asking Questions podcast on Apple, Spotify, or any other podcatcher. See you next week.